In this follow-up video to the earlier video on plain language nominalization and conversion, or going back between the two, I want to give you two written examples, two published examples of writing that has gone through a process of revision, more than likely, and been made public. These two documents, one is a letter posted to the attention of some employees at Staples. The other is a letter addressed to the general public or perhaps more internally but shared with the public from the president of NBC, Deborah Turnus, about the Brian Williams suspension. Both documents employ what I think are pretty good examples of not plain style as well as plain style. So I want to start with the Staples document. As with any of our drafts, first drafts are never really written very plainly. Revision is the key to writing plainly, if you want to write plainly. And remember, writing plainly is not a prescription to writing well. Writing plainly is actually just one method or one tool you can employ. So for our class, you're practicing writing plainly, and you shouldn't accept that that's the only way to write. It's just one tool in your tool belt or toolbox of tools. So. If you're having any trouble with the content that I'm about to discuss in this video, be sure you've watched the earlier video content in which we use and define the terms and illustrate the terms nominalization, causality, grammar of a sentence, passive and active voices. I presume you've, you've discussed those ideas with yourself and you've worked through them enough that you're familiar with them if you're watching this video. So in this first letter, which you can also find a copy of inside of our Blackboard module, as well as the Brian Williams email um, letter. I want you to read through this letter for a second, and I'll read along for the first paragraph, and we can start to see a pattern of omission. So recent changes have necessitated a strong stance on part-time associates going beyond 25 hours worked per week. Due to these changes, no part-time associates are scheduled beyond 25 hours. Unfortunately, despite not being scheduled more than 25 hours, several associates still clocked in for more than 25 hours. Well. This is not the most easy to read prose. We kind of can get the idea of what's going on here, but it may require that we read it a couple times. Ask yourself the question, after reading it once or listening to me stumble through it once, did you understand 100% of what's going on here? Or could this content be revised to make the ideas more clearly? So we can practice a few plain language principles here as a matter of going back and forth. So a series of questions we can use as a protocol can guide us through any sentence to ask questions about its plainness. So we'll take this first sentence here. Recent changes have necessitated a strong stance. Okay, my question in any sentence we're going to edit or work through is the question of who and the action. So who? Who is in this sentence? Who is doing things? Well, we don't really know. We have part-time associates. So we'll highlight that for a second. We'll come back to that later. Okay, we have part-time associates. Who else? Anybody else in here? Well, not really, but someone has to be acting. And this is kind of part of the problem of this letter. There's no ownership. There's no actions being owned by an actor. Instead, we have an object here, a strong stance on part-time associates going beyond. So we can take a second and answer the question, who? If there's not one present, we can invent one, or as the situation kind of explains itself, we could probably figure out who it is. It's probably the I later on. So perhaps management, perhaps staples the company writ large, perhaps supervisors, it doesn't really matter. My question here is, who's changed things? Who's necessitated or made something by need? Who's going? Look at all these action words here that are hiding out, not really as the, the verb of the sentence. So what is the actual verb in the sentence? What's the conjugated verb here? Well, have necessitated. So we ask a simple question. Can an abstract idea, something you can't even hold in your hand, such as changes, necessitate? Well, figuratively, sure, but how about causally? Really the question here is, who changes? What has changed? Something has to have gone through a substantive change for us to describe it as a noun or a change. So think about that for a second. What's changed? And as you probably know as much here as I know about the situation, we might not know what's changed. But we can we can either put something together or figure some things out. But let's take, a, let's take this example. 
perhaps due to recent financial problems, we have needed to change how we view part-time employment and the number of hours part-time associates are working per week. So now we have a, a sentence. We've added a couple elements to it, but at its core we still have the same sense of idea. But we, now we have something a little bit more stable in terms of who's doing things or who can do things in the sentence. There's a we, whether it's management, whether it's supervisor, whether it's again staples writ large. We have needed or we needed to change how we and now change you notice is back into a verb form it's actually an um, unconjugated or infinite form here so we are changing or needing to change how we again we have an agency how we view and the number of hours are working per week so we have this idea of ownership now each in each part of the sentence we can see here that we can revise this sentence and you can compare these two nobody is present in the sentence with the red and there are people present here in the green sentence. So by comparison, you might see that one is easier to read than the other. We can even get rid of the cause if it helps you. Think about things being one-to-one -one here from sentence to sentence. Okay, now we go to the second sentence and we look at it. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to just completely elide that and say ours is better now. Due to these changes, okay, no part-time associates are scheduled to be on 25 hours. Okay, what's the conjugated verb or the verb phrase here? Are scheduled. Okay, great. So who does the scheduling? Here's a question of passive voice and active voice. So are the associates doing their own scheduling? If they are, we know it's an active voice sentence, but based on that 2B plus the participle ED, so scheduled here, we know that this is actually a passive voice structure. We can add an expression here if it helps to clarify by someone. So due to these changes, no part-time associates are scheduled by someone beyond 25 hours. The sentence is it's backwards. That's someone that we want perhaps want anyway, is here at the end of the sentence. It's like a little red riding hood in the earlier style how-to on verbs and voicings. Okay, great. So when we look at this document then, we want to know where are these people? Okay, we can probably put the person back at the beginning. As human beings, again, we do like story. We like a character, we like action, we like it up front because it clarifies what's happening, who's doing it right off the bat before we build into something more complicated. If you can follow a formula of familiar to unfamiliar in a sentence, you can economize on your reader's ability to understand an idea and move into an unknown idea. So due to these changes, no part-time associates are scheduled by someone beyond 25 hours. We can revise this one in the same one. So due to this change, uh, we will no longer schedule part-time associates beyond 25 hours. All of a sudden now, you're going to notice a pattern start to form. There's some sense of consistent cohesion or sticking togetherness. Many people want to call this flow. We needed to change how we view part-time. Due to these changes, we will no longer schedule part-time associates beyond 25 hours. And then we get to this next sentence. Despite not being scheduled, well again, who? Several, shows, several associates still clocked in for more than 25. So we have an active voice thing here. We have an active voicing of this action, and so we do know who's doing this thing. But it's kind of moved away from where we're with the we. That's okay. The idea here is to make clear in this very first step of revision who is doing things. And you can go back then and modify how sentences connect to one another so it's more of, an, uh, of a transitional idea from old idea to new idea, which then becomes old idea in the next sentence. But look through these kinds of sentences. It is your responsibility to manage your time. If you'd written the sentence in a document, you might get a reply back from me such as, I don't know, um, wordy or plain language issue. It's not that this sentence is difficult to understand, but it's that the sentence occludes who's doing things. It hides what's going on. So say it more simply. You must manage your own time. We expect you to manage your own time. For example, these two expressions make clear some elements very quickly, namely who is doing what. You must. We expect you to manage. The idea of ownership of action now is present throughout the document, or at least what we revised so far. As you go through the paragraph, so you'll notice the same problem of lack of ownership or agency being clear is present in these sentences. You can see by your punches. Okay, 
you can see your punches rather. This is pretty direct. Going forward, exceeding. So we have an action word here, exceeding, that's a verb, will result. Can exceeding result in documentation? Well, no, you need agency. If an associate exceeds 25 hours, that associate will receive a documentation or I will document the, that associate. Something that, that makes clear who's doing these things. And you can go through this document. So by comparison then, we can look at this Brian Williams email or memo. And we can diagnose it. We can look at it and see who's doing things. We have decided to suspend Brian Williams. Who's doing that? Well, we, 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 we're owning that. The suspension will be without pay. So now it's definitional. So when you get into definitions, the form of to be using a, some sort of linking verb in this way is, is a great idea because it's definitional and you don't really need a different kind of action word. But it returns here to the sentence agency. We. What's going to happen as a result? Lester Holt will do this thing. Our review which is being led by Richard Esposito, working closely with etc., is ongoing. So again, definitional. But I think, and it comes back to making clear who is doing this thing. And again, who, Brian misrepresented, subject, verb, very clear. It then became clear. Now we get into something that's perhaps more cliche than plain language. And so it then became clear that on other occasions. So here's an opportunity to revise. How might you revise this? This was wrong. When it comes to writing plainly. This is, is a great word in person when you're standing in front of someone and have a pointer finger pointing at something, this or that, here or there. But in writing, this is better served with a noun that follows it. So perhaps this behavior, this action, for example, putting a noun after the phrase that is summative or summarizes the preceding idea into an expression. This is when anomalization becomes useful because you don't have to restate the sentence. You can boil it down to a summary expression. So compare these two documents when you get a moment and see how you can take something as as simple as a, a, a letter posted on a wall at a Staples um, employee lounge or a letter sent out by an NBC president and think about these are all opportunities to revise. Even though this went out from the NBC president, it probably could have gone through another round. Does it need to? No, probably not. It did what it needed to do. This one from Staples, uh, the Staples manager, whoever has written it, probably could use some more vision because it doesn't really clarify who's, who's taking responsibility for action. But you can't really blame that manager or that management because no one wants to take responsibility for these kinds of changes to policies. And sometimes you want to hide who's doing the action. Sometimes you want to remove yourself from the equation. Think about any um, legislature, legislators, um, politicians in general. We joke about their ability to lie, prevaricate, make things seem more difficult than they really are, talk around the issue. Well, that's kind of the opposite of plain language. So think about that when you're trying to write for this class or any class. Ask yourself, what's your purpose? If you're trying to be direct and explain an idea simply, be straightforward, plain language generally serves you well. However, if you're trying to be kind of difficult or beat around the bush, maybe plain language isn't the right way in that moment. So you have to choose. It's not a matter of do it every single time. As I remark elsewhere, if you get a plain language note on your paper, it doesn't mean you need to fix a problem. You've written the sentence well, its grammar is great. However, it's an opportunity for you to think about whether or not you, your argument, or your idea would be better served by an expression of a different kind. So think about that as you're revising.